Hey friends, Michael Kingswood here, and it's story time. Time to go on to the next two chapters of Outdweller, Glimmer Vero Chronicles number two, because that's what you came here for. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to tease you and spend a bit of time talking about news. But I don't really have any news, so we'll just get right into the story. Written by me, read by Kevin Sapp, who, as you know, is pretty awesome. Uh, have fun. Enjoy these chapters. If you haven't, obviously this chapter is 15 to 16 so if you've not started the book yet and this is your first time coming around go back a few episodes and start from the beginning obviously uh otherwise enjoy i'll talk to you after the chapters on the flip side 15 under arrest they ran to the orlock radrick had longer legs and julian had to push hard to match his pace by the time they reached the inn he was out of breath and his legs felt rubbery he did not normally run so far so quickly. He derived some comfort from the fact that Radric was also breathing heavily. Some. They burst into the tap room and veered straight toward the bar, where Molly held court. Julian hardly noticed the patrons except to think mildly that it was nice how they all got out of their way. Respect. Uh, no, wait, that wasn't it. They all looked startled, frightened. One serving girl squeaked as they rushed past and dropped her tray and its contents to the floor. Molly watched this and scowled, planting her hands on her hips. Stop right there! Her voice cut through the air like a horn, bringing Julian up short and Radric with him. He had not heard someone shout like that since... All at once, he realized he still had his sword brandished. And he looked down at himself. His clothing was bloodstained in many places, from the scene in Dewey's room. Radric was in a similar state and wore a murderous expression to go with it. No wonder people had cleared out of their way. He and Radric must have scared the hell out of them. Stupid. What do you think you're doing charging in here like this? Julian had seen Molly irritated before, but never truly angry. Until now. Her brow furrowed, her face flushed deep red, and her eyes glittered dangerously. You get yourselves... Her tirade vanished beneath Radric's shouted, Quiet! His tone was the same whip-crack of command that he used during the heat of battle to order his squad to change tactics. He must have practiced it for weeks, because it was unerringly able to pierce the din of battle or, in this case, Molly's speech. Radric fixed a deadly serious stare on her, and she shrank back. Lauren Haverstead, Radric continued in that same tone of command. Where is he? All around, patrons looked at each other, Radric's words having easily reached their ears. Already he could see the wheels turning, the seeds of new rumors beginning to flourish. Molly blinked, taken aback but obviously still angry. His room, I think. What is this about? You have no right— Which room? Radric waited a half second, then demanded again, more loudly, Which room? Room seven. What— The key. Molly drew herself up and shook her head. Now see here, you can't just barge into one of my guests' rooms. I've got a... The key or I break down the door. Silence followed for several seconds and Molly and Radric locked eyes, her seething anger mixed with no little confusion against his rock-solid resolve. Slowly, Molly's expression changed, moving away from anger toward nervousness and then fear. She swallowed. He's not the one who... She trailed off her words fading away to a whisper as the import of what was happening sank in. Just give us the key, Molly, so we can handle it. Molly nodded shakily and reached into one of the pockets in her apron. She pulled out a medium-sized key ring and took a moment to fumble through them until she found the one she needed. She had to try twice to get it off the ring, and then she held it out to Radric. Thank you, he said, and snatched it out of her grasp. Then he turned toward the staircase at the rear of the taproom, glancing at Julian as he went. Let's go. Radric led the way up the stairs, with Julian right behind him. It had been some time since he had last been on the Orlock's upper level, and as they burst into the upstairs landing, memories swept back over Julian. Good times, and bad. Mostly stressful, to be honest. They had lived here during the conflict with Eisenhof, and that was as stomach-clenching a situation as Julian had seen. Up until now, anyway. He shoved the memories aside and followed his friend down the hall and around the corner to room 7. It was conveniently located adjacent to the baths and privy, but Julian was surprised that Lauren had not opted for Molly's more luxurious suite. He certainly had the coin for it. 
Not that it mattered now. They reached the door and paused for only the briefest of moments. Then Raedric jabbed the key into the lock and shoved the door open. The room was small, smaller than the room at Bigsby's, but well furnished. It differed from the room Julian and Raedric had stayed in, in that there was only one bed. But aside from that, it was identical. Except that this room had a short mage with one leg out of the window, looking like he was just returning from some bit of malfeasance or another. Well, Julian said, that answers that. How dare you! Morin snapped, wrenching his leg over the windowsill even as he reached for his staff, which lay on the floor, where he had dropped it while climbing in. What is the meaning of this? Raedric wasted no time in answering. Moving with all the speed at his disposal, and he had quite a lot, he bounded across the room and struck Lauren with a left cross. The mage did not even try to block it, so surprised he was. Raedric's fist struck him in the cheek, and his head snapped backwards into his left. He staggered backwards and struck the wall, then fell forward onto his knees as his hands flew to his face. Raedric grabbed him by the back of the neck and flung him to the ground, then straddled him as he took hold of his wrists and forced his hands behind his back. Then Raedric looked up at Julian and quirked an eyebrow at him. Julian smirked and reached into the belt pouch where he kept his manacles, then handed them to him. Lauren Haverstead, Raedric said in his most professionally cold tone while he locked the manacles around the mage's wrists. You are under arrest for the murders of Balin Rorickson, Beverly Winslow, Cora Fredolin, and Dewey the Woodsman. Preposterous, Lauren said. I demand you release me at once. Raedric just snorted in his ear, then, with Julian's help, hauled him to his feet. Lauren's right cheek was already beginning to swell. It was going to be one hell of a bruise. He was lucky Raedric had not struck him lower, or he would have lost several teeth. All the same, his eyes were defiant, furious. You are making a grave mistake, constables. His voice was cold, venomous, promising swift retribution against them. The problem was, Julian was not sure that he could not deal out that retribution, even from a jail cell. From the look in his eyes, Lauren believed he could do just that. Julian just hoped they were right about this. The journey from the Orlock to the Constabulary was normally fairly quick, but this night it seemed to take forever. Halfway there, Lauren seemed to come out of a daze and begin to struggle surprisingly vigorously for a man his size, especially one who presumably did not get much in the way of exercise. After all, what need does a mage have for physical force? It took both Julian and Raedric's full effort to keep him in line, and going the right direction. By the time they reached their office and got the cell block door open, though, it seemed to get through Lauren's head that he was stuck, and they were not going to let up. He ceased his struggles and complied with Raedric's commands without complaint, even walking himself into his cell. When they closed and locked the cell door, he wore a mocking little grin on his face that never translated to his eyes. They burned with simmering anger. Julian had been stared down by many men before, but he could not recall anyone offhand who had done it as effectively as this mage. He hurried out of the cell block as quickly as he could once the cell was secured. He thought he heard Lauren chuckle mockingly as he went. Sixteen. A not-so-friendly chat. The two of them divided their efforts. After getting Lauren secured in the cell, Raedric went back to Bigsby's to more thoroughly investigate the scene, while Julian went back to the Orlock to look through Lauren's effects. Julian did not envy Raedric his half of the night's investigation. Not one bit. But after an hour and a half in Lauren's room with nothing of pertinence to show for it, he almost could have considered swapping. Almost. Finally, he decided to call it quits and went back to the office. Word had spread quickly about the arrest, or so it seemed. The streets were more crowded than normal for the hour. It was approaching four bells, bedtime for most, especially on a work night. But tonight, groups of men turned to watch him pass at every street corner. A few shouted inquiries at him. Had they truly caught the killer? Was it safe for their wives to go out again? What about the children? When was the hanging? That came the most often, making Julian swallow nervously as he answered with only a shake of his head. If people got it into their heads that a hanging was in order, they might not be satisfied with anything short of that very thing. And if that became the case and they decided to take things into their own collective hands, that could get ugly real quick. 
Julian picked up his pace, hurrying, but not enough to make it seem he was doing anything but walking. It was almost with a feeling of relief that he turned the last corner and caught sight of the constabulary. The feeling passed quickly as he beheld the scene there. Mayor Brimley stood with Radric on the front porch outside of Julian and Radric's office. The mayor was barely dressed. His leggings were clearly pajama pants that had been tucked hurriedly into his boots, and Julian could swear beneath his formal coat was only a pajama top. He wore his mayoral badge prominently, though, and despite his disheveled appearance, he did a fairly decent approximation of a man with power who was lording over his subordinates. Too bad Julian had seen him cower in the face of danger not so very long ago, or he might have believed the act. Mayor Brimley wrung his hands anxiously as Julian stepped up onto the porch, but the look he directed at Radric was made of steel. What do you think you're doing? Radric was far more politic than Julian would have been. Master Mayor, we caught him red-handed, sneaking through the window of the Orlock after we observed him fleeing the scene of tonight's murder. There can be no doubt. Mayor Brimley began chewing on his lip for a moment, still wringing his hands while he pondered. Then, finally, he sighed, his shoulders slumping. Do you have any idea what the Magisterium will do when they hear of this? It simply is not done, accosting a high-ranking member of their order like this. How many high-ranking members of their order engage in capital crimes, Master Mayor? Julian could not keep the scorn from his voice. And why not? Any group that would blindly defend their own, even when in the wrong, was deserving of such. Mayor Brimley glanced over at Julian, and his scowl grew more dark. Then, after a minute, he nodded, conceding the point. I still don't like it. We'll pay for this, mark me. But you agree we may proceed? Mayor Brimley inhaled, and for a moment Julian thought sure he was going to say no. But then he let his breath out in a long sigh and nodded. Radric returned the nod and pulled the constabulary doors open, then disappeared within. Julian paused to make a quick half-bow, as befitted the mayor's rank and position, then followed his friend. Julian followed Radric into the cell block and tried not to shrink back from nerves. Mages were dangerous. Yes, they had taken away Lauren's staff, and anything that looked like it could be used as a component in some spell, but that did not mean Lauren could not have other tricks up his sleeve. The mage was ensconced in the last cell on the left, as far from the barred doorway into the front office as possible. Very little light from the cell block's two lamps made it back into the cell, and for a moment it almost looked as though Lauren were not there at all. Then a soft rustling issued from the cell, and the shadows in the rear of the cell moved, as Lauren sat up from where he was lying on his little cot. I trust you have not come to set me free. Julian snorted loudly and crossed his arms over his chest. Why did you kill them? Radric's voice was cold, his expression sharp and focused, the way it got before a fight. Julian's eyes had adjusted better to the dimness. He could just make out the outlines of Lauren's face as he shook his head. I have killed no one. Here. So it was just a coincidence that you were at the scene of tonight's murder? Radric sniffed slightly. Only the simplest of minds believes in such a thing as coincidence. Lauren added an extra emphasis and a bit of derision to the last word. Julian and Radric shared glances. That was not a denial. It was also not an admission. All right, Radric said. Why were you there if you didn't do it? Why were you, Constable? This was getting nowhere. We are asking the questions here, Julian said, irritation lending extra heat to his tone that he had not intended. If you don't want to never see the outside of a jail cell again, you'll... Lauren chuckled, a soft sound that carried easily to Julian's ears and contained entire levels of disdain. I do not answer to a man who lowers himself to the use of double negatives, and I will remain in this cell only as long as I deign to allow it, and not one second more. The shadow of his head shook and his body shifted, lying back down onto his cot. Now leave me. Julian ground his teeth to stop himself from lashing out with all manner of curses against the mage's lineage, particularly his mother. He had no idea what Lauren was talking about, but he could deal with that. What really got under his skin was the superior attitude, the condescension, especially now while he was locked up. 
Did he not understand the situation, or was he arrogant enough to truly think little things like the law did not apply to him? Probably the latter, if truth be told. The magisterium had a nearly free hand in most things, answering only to the king. Only a couple of ignorant bumpkins would dare lay hands on one of their order, let alone a member with the rank Lauren apparently held. Lord, but he hated being called Bumpkin, even when it was he who was doing the calling. You didn't answer the question, Lauren, Radric said softly. His eyes seemed to burn, reflecting the dim lamplight as though the lamp's fire was their own. But I have, Constable. You simply refuse to hear it. The shadow that was Lauren moved slightly, making a mockingly dismissive gesture at them, unless Julian missed his guess. Then he lay still. A moment later, soft snoring issued from the cell. How in the hell had he gotten to sleep that quickly and with the pair of them standing right there, no less? Julian shook his head and stalked toward the front office. He looked back as he stepped through the doorway. Radric was still there, staring daggers into the cell. He remained for almost a full minute before turning away and moving to join Julian. Yes, this was not going well at all. Radric closed the door to the cell block and locked it, then replaced the key on its ring near his desk. What do you make of that? he said. Arrogant cuss. Radric snorted out a half chuckle. Did you expect anything else? He flopped down into his desk chair and leaned back, chewing on his lip in thought. We could always yank off a fingernail or two, Julian offered as he took his own seat. That'll help ease his tongue. He meant it as a bad joke, but the look Radric shot him stopped Julian cold. He raised his hands at the simmering anger in his friend's eyes. Joke, Ray. Radric scowled. It's not funny. Yeah, I can see that. So much for a little levity. Well, let's review. We've got him dead to rights at the scene, but we need more before he goes to the judge. Julian held up a finger. No blood on him. No sign he's been in a fight. <laughs> Ever. No. Only a mage could have killed those men the way they were. And a mage could easily clean himself up. Julian nodded. Yes, but do you think that will satisfy the judge? Did you find anything more definitive at the scene tonight? Radric sighed and looked down at his desk. The simmering anger was gone, replaced by frustrated acceptance as he shook his head. I don't think so either. Any ideas? Radric did not sound particularly hopeful. Julian could not blame him. Maybe things would look better in the morning. In jail, and it's only chapter 16, so... Um, I guess I didn't really need those other 20 chapters that I told you about before when I told you there was 36. So, all right, so we're done. See you later. <laughs> Except not really, right? Um, clearly more is going on. And uh, just because they got the bad guy in jail, they think. Um, clearly there's more coming because you know you're not even halfway through the book yet. Um, so, but yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see what comes next. Certainly this Lauren guy is pretty unflappable and uh, appears to be pretty confident with himself. I guess we'll see what happens. That'll happen next week when you come back here for the next couple chapters. Again, if you can't wait that long, then you shouldn't. You should You should be unable to wait. This is such an ep epic gripping. Uh, maybe not epic, but it's a good book, I think. And other people who've read it think. Surely you do, too. That's why you're still listening. So go pick up a copy if you haven't already. SSNStorytelling.com is the web store. You can get there through MichaelKingswood.com, too, but uh, the link there will take you to SSN Storytelling. Uh, but you can get it there at any uh, format that you want, ebook, audiobook, print, and yeah, all the proceeds go directly through me, not through a middleman, except for the payment processors. I can do PayPal, Stripe, and I can take cryptocurrency, too, if you want to pay me in, in Bitcoin or Litecoin or something like that. I'll take it. Um I've taken it for years, uh, but the yeah, of course you can find it in you know Amazon and those other places. But the middlemen take a bigger cut there. Um, if it goes straight to me, I get more profit. So that's why I'm doing it. But if you don't want to buy the book or for some reason you can't, that's cool. Come back next week and uh, listen in. But do please like uh, the podcast or the video or wherever you are. Subscribe to all your buddies. 
spread the word about all the cool things we're doing here because more eyes and ears equals good equals more readers equals better equals greater enjoyment in the world and satisfaction at a job well done and hopefully people who will buy the book and give me money uh but yeah in the meantime uh, do have a great week i'll talk to you next time until then don't do anything i wouldn't do